Ruby, Volume 4, Episode 8. A much-needed talk. What happens? We begin with Crow and Ranger around a campfire, just after Crow's explained to the maidens to the kids. Ruby and the others then recap what Crow just told them, even though the audience already knows all of this already. Jean gets pissy and walks away from the campsite. Jean soon returns to his designated log, and Crow begins a four-minute-long World of Remnant detailing the story of two brothers. Crow's story also explains that there are four relics in the world representative of creation, destruction, knowledge, and choice, and that these relics are safeguarded at the academies around the world. We then cut away to Blake, who, while nervous, gets prompted by her mother to talk to her dad. The two then have a delightfully real and awkward talk until Sun accidentally interrupts. Back at the campfire, the kids seem nervous about all that they've learned. Crow doesn't do an amazing job quelling those nerves, but does make it clear that Haven is their next goal so he can talk to the headmaster there. Ruby pretends to have a character arc for a moment, and then after some prompting, Crow explains that his semblance is bad luck. We then go back to Menagerie, where we find Blake hitting Sun because he's found some information about the White Fang. She continues to be a colossal bitch and throws his scroll, revealing an enemy hidden in the trees. When the spy runs, Blake and Sun chase after her, so of course, now that some action started, we instead cut back to Ruby and friends calmly waking up. But all is not well, as it becomes clear that Tyrion Stinger did a lot more than simply scratch Crow, as he's now coughing up purple shit. Jean's bitchy attitude is understandable, but that doesn't make it any less annoying. I get that it's easier to get mad at Crow than to blame himself for Pyrrha's death, but his smarm feels so conceited. Pyrrha's death meant a lot to me! I want to be mad about it! However, it is a believable reaction, so I'm not mad that it's here. What I am upset about is how Jean's the only one with a reaction. Pyrrha was Renanora's friend too, and Ruby actually watched her die. Yet we haven't seen any of them have any problems like Jean. At first, it seemed like we would see Ruby deal with Pyrrha's death, since she was having nightmares. But those only lasted one episode, and was overshadowed by Jean's midnight training. Jean was the focus again. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad scene, but I don't understand why he's the only one we get to see handle the loss of a close friend. Because he loved Pyrrha. No. Jean kissed Pyrrha. Jean spent two and a half volumes fawning over Weiss, remember? At most, Jean had a crush on Pyrrha, but they weren't dating, and his infatuation with Weiss was given more screen time than his budding relationship with Pyrrha. It's that same problem as earlier, where I can't help but think, Miles wrote it so his character gets to do the big dramatic scene. I don't want to think like that, but when Jean's the only one who gets to react here, then it's kind of hard to ignore. One could argue that Ren, Nora, and Ruby are used to hiding their problems when it comes to death and stuff, but if the audience doesn't get let in on that fact, then we can't be sure. Maybe the group had a big talk about Pyrrha before the volume started, but if it's not shown to the audience, then it may as well not have happened. I'm fine with Jean having trouble dealing with this loss, but I just wish some of Pyrrha's other friends seemed to care too. Why do they recap the maidens for us? It's not like there's some obscure detail more casual viewers are likely to forget. The story and properties of maidens are the reason for the main conflict in Volume 3. Did the gang just find this convenient campsite? Or did they make it and want to guarantee that almost everyone could have their own log to sit on? It's a nice touch that Crow fiddles with his flask cap. It brings a bit of life to the performance, where no one's really allowed to move much again. So the story of two brothers is really important. But on a rewatch, it's also really, really boring. It's so slow, and the visuals are lackluster, even on a first viewing. It takes Crow forever to get to the point, and when you already know the story, this part feels like it drags on. Compare this to Yang's story about looking for her mom when she was younger. The visuals are way more interesting than just silhouettes on a rock since they convey emotion to the viewer. Even Pyrrha's maiden story is more interesting, despite its simpler style. Once again, there's emotion in the characters, while Crow's shadow puppets only offer the bare necessities in terms of display. While the effects of his story being shadows cast on the stone is cool, what we're actually looking at leaves a lot to be desired in visual interest. It doesn't help that his story is so long. In both of the examples used earlier, those scenes only lasted about a minute each. Even if you've already seen the story being told, you don't have to wait very long to get back to the characters we care about. The whole Brothers section of Crow's story seems totally supplemental. The relevant information given and answer to Jean's question is only the stuff pertaining to the relics. Out of Crow's four minute long story, three of those minutes are dedicated to the Brothers. I think it would have benefited the pace of the episode if the brother section of the story was shaved down. I like that the relics aren't just the usual JRPG earth, water, fire, and air elements. 
It's refreshing for them to represent such broad topics and helps them feel unique to the world of Remnant. Crow is kind of vague about them though. There's been a lot of debate on what the relics actually are. People? Glowy orbs? Is one Ozpin's cane? I don't fucking know. Crow spent so long explaining the beginning of man that he forgot to give any good details on the relics. Also, when I first saw this episode, I couldn't help but think, really? More special MacGuffins? Maidens were solid. We understood them, they had made an impact on the story directly in the volume they were introduced in. But the relics feel ambiguous and unconnected. We don't know anything about them physically, so we don't know if we've seen one yet. Also, this means the audience no longer has any idea on what Salem's plan is. When all we had was Maidens, then it was easy to deduce a couple of theories on her plans. Make herself queen to the Maidens and rule over the world with their influence. Force Cinder to become every Maiden. Go through a series of devout followers who become the different Maidens and kill them so Salem can obtain all their power. But now that we have the relics, we don't know what to think. The relics are so nebulous that we don't know what would happen if Salem got one. Also, now we don't know why Cinder was meant to become the Fall Maiden. The audience is just kind of hanging in the air, waiting to get more information so we can start to piece it all together. This is a fine situation to put the audience in, but I hope that information gets dropped soon, as a villain can be much more intimidating if we can surmise on just what it is they're up to. To give an example of what I mean, just seeing the Joker isn't as spooky as seeing the Joker with a tied up victim and a chainsaw. Him alone doesn't offer much to fear, but we can make our own conclusions as to what he's going to do with that chainsaw. Blake's talk with Gira is great. It's so real. It gives us some backstory, is written and acted believably. This scene is the best Blake gets this volume. There were a lot of fanboys who got super mad at Sun for interrupting, but I thought it was hilarious. It also makes sense, since Sun could probably hear the conversation to some degree outside. It would be less intrusive to just wait for the conversation to end than to barge in with his news. Why doesn't Ruby already know Crow's semblance? She's trained with him and adores the guy. You'd think at least once she'd ask. There's even a smarter way to set up Crow explaining it to the audience while including Ruby also knowing about it. You could have Ruby say, Why couldn't you trust me? Is it because of your semblance? Nora or someone could be like, What's so special about your semblance? And then he can begin his super edgy backstory like how he does. If your semblance is bad luck, then what the heck do you call turning into a bird? A hobby? It is fun to look back at previous scenes Crow's been in and finding his bad luck appearing. Like when it caused that bartender to drop his glass. Blake is a piece of shit. If her previous scene with Gira is the best she gets this volume, then her hitting son is the worst. She's fucking abusive. This show handles abusive relationships, why would they think it's okay and funny to have Blake hitting Sun like this? Especially since it follows the episode where Weiss got hit by her dad and it was a very dramatic moment. Just because it's not shot at an artsy angle or has super dramatic music behind it doesn't make it any better. How come when Adam or Jacques hits someone, it's serious, but when Blake does it, it's fine? Because she's one of the main characters? Bullshit. Just because Blake's a cute cat girl does not mean she should get a pass on this. Girls can be abusive too. Sun's intentions are to help her here. The White Fang means a lot to her and this is important information for her to know. He in no way deserves to get hit like this. Oh, you interrupted a conversation? This isn't even the last of it. She's constantly yelling at him unless he's complimenting her. When he does something she doesn't like, he gets hit or yelled at, or gets his stuff broken. But when she agrees with him, then he gets rewarded with compliments like, My hero. This is by the book abusive behavior. Aaron, the voice of Blake, actually has this big post about how people who have been abused can often become abusers themselves, and that's what Blake's going through here. The problem is, I don't want to root for an abuser. There's this big divide in the Ruby community. One side wants Blake to be with Sun, and the other wants her with Yang. Well, I say it's a dumb argument because she doesn't deserve either of them. I don't want to see these characters get hit by their loved ones or even friends, and I don't want them stuck in a toxic relationship with some bitch. I was watching the director's commentary for this volume, and Miles had mentioned that when he wrote the script, he intended for it to be a girly slap on the shoulder. When he saw this shit, he was shocked, but said it was fine! There is no difference between this scene, this scene, and this scene. In my eyes, Blake is now a villain. Her being pretty or kinda sad doesn't justify these actions, and until RT redeems themselves, I am actively rooting against her. Not interested in fighting the White Fang, huh? Sure did run after Ilya pretty quickly. 
If Ilya didn't want to get spotted, she shouldn't have worn that bright ass mask. The way Jean and Ren sit up, it looks like they've just been lying there for a while before finally getting up. Like, they just get up so quick, you know? Crow's being sick was riveting the first time I saw this volume. Pyrrha's death established that people can and will die in this show, and I couldn't ever convince myself that they wouldn't get rid of Crow this early. Crow's health kept me on the edge of my seat until they made it to safety. Great job, 10 out of 10. Nitpick Corner returns! None of this is super important, but I feel like it's at least worth mentioning a little. When Crow gets a drink here, his flask never touches his lips, and he immediately starts talking again. Like, he doesn't have any time to swallow. During Crow's story, the younger brother's chest shadow thing is flickering heavily, while the older brother's chest light is astutely present. It's a little distracting. Lindsay's Ruby voice sounds more and more phoned in as we go. Like, Ruby sounds like someone doing a voice. It's most noticeable when Ruby's sad, like her line of, Her. You mean, Salem? Here's a fun thing you can do. Go rewatch some early volume one Ruby, and you can really hear how different she used to sound. With such a tall spout, you would have to tip the pot further than that for tea to pour. Ruby's tea pouring has never been super stellar. Blake says, a spy, as if she's correcting Sun, but ninja isn't an inaccurate way of describing Ilya. And so, that was a much needed talk. I think the only one who needs a talk is the RT crew for allowing Blake to become so loathable. Blake's abuse is the worst part of this entire volume. It made her akin to a villain. This episode is boring at first, but would be overall pretty good if it wasn't for this shit. Blake's first scene is amazing, and everything around the campfire is informative. Meaning that Blake's character and this episode was sullied by the shift into unnecessary abuse. It's different from when Nora slaps Ren, because Nora's intent wasn't to hurt him, but to snap him out of his rage. Blake's putting all of her effort into hitting Sun, and he's clearly hurt by it. The worst part is, I don't think Blake's going to get reprimanded at all, or learn a lesson or anything. Because she's been really hurt by the events in Volume 3. Fuck that! The Ruby Crew has successfully written a believable and deep bad guy, and made her one of the main four characters. If I could remove Blake hitting Sun out of this episode, then it would be really solid with lots of lore and some real standout performances from the Belladonnas. But I can't. Blake alone makes this one of the worst episodes this volume, and both she and Rooster Teeth need to learn that it's not okay to hit a friend who's trying to help you. Let's gather around the campfire and sing our campfire song. Our C A M P F I R E S O N G song. And if you don't think that we can sing it faster, then you're wrong. But it would help if you just sing along. Bum, bum, bum. C A M P F I R E S O N G song. C A M P F I R E S O N G song. If you don't think that we could sing it faster, then you're wrong. But it would help if you just sing along. C A M P F I R E S O N G song. Uncle Crow! Song. C A M P F I R E S O N G John! Good! It'll help, it'll help, if you just sing along, oh yeah! Hey, there you go, that's Ruby singing Campfire Song song.